<clears throat> so let's start with the uh, discussion question from section three. Um, I want to want you to write down number one, like what would be a significant purchase for you? So they talked about having uh, accountability partners for people who um, aren't married. So what would be a significant purchase for you? Right now? So what level dollar level is what we're looking for? So fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. You know what dollar value? Would you consider to be a significant purchase? So go ahead and write that down. And then be ready to give your answer here. What would be a all I want is a dollar value at this point. All you need. So let's go daily. What's your dollar value? Uh, it would be four yeah. Well, give the number. Let's take every purchase. Yeah, dollar value is a per purchase. Any number? Well, what number would you be, Elizabeth? Like 200. 200 to 300, okay. 200. Okay. 200. 100. 300. 300. 1,000, okay. So, <clears throat> Uh, Taylor, what was your number? I said 300. Okay. So, yeah, it, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different. And so the question then is, what would you do uh, when you get up to those levels that are high? Who do you go and consult with? So I want you to write a name down on your paper. Uh, who you would go and talk to is the idea of when you're starting to get a significant purchase, who would that person be? Write that down. And why that person? So why that person? So we're not going off this, by the way, if you're looking at the screen, listen to what I'm saying. You got a, your dollar value, the name of a person, and why that person? Why do you think that they would be helpful to you with a significant purchase? Anna, give me a number between three and seven. Three. One, two, three. Caleb, why was your person you picked? It was my dad. Okay. Because he handled the money for my family. Okay. And do you think, uh, how would his advice come to you in terms of why do you value what he's going to say uh, beyond just that, you know, he's good with money or something? I mean, what, give me a little bit more detail. Okay, so he's going to question, make sure your motives are good and your, that it makes sense, kind of help you reason through that. So some of this chapter is how we can get so wrapped up with emotion, right, on, on purchases that we're literally high, uh, literally high. So your body releases some of those endorphins and you can literally cloud your brain with real chemicals that your body, not, you're not taking cocaine or anything. You are high as a kite sometimes. How many have felt that feeling when you're getting something new that you really, really wanted? How many of you have felt that little bit of a high, right? That, that's real. That's real chemical changes in your body. And so it's good to have your accountability partner uh, to come in and hopefully help you reason through things with your brain and not just your heart. Okay, so let's look at Joaquin. Oh, wait, let's see, did I want to? Oh, yeah, from section four, I guess I wanted to do this one. So the video talked about waiting overnight. So when has waiting overnight to make a decision benefited you? When has waiting overnight benefited you? Or how 
not going to benefit you in the future. Tend to write that down. Two, three, Sienna. I know you're still writing, but give me a little heads up here. What are, what's your overnight? Have you had that happen yourself, or what are you writing? Yeah, I'm like, okay. Okay. So you kind of got roped in, did it, and then waited overnight, and ended up changing your mind. Yeah. So the overnight thing is actually related to that chemical I was just talking about, about being high. So waiting one night, those chemicals proceed back to wherever they live in your body, and you basically come up to it, and you can kind of come to your senses. Uh, now, you might, still need, you might still make the purchase, right? You might still make the purchase, um, but you are kind of beyond that physical response of purchasing. Uh, anybody else want to share a story of waiting overnight for something that kind of made a difference? Maybe you bought it, maybe you didn't buy it. You could go either way, like I said. No big car purchase or anything. All right, let's move on to Joaquin. And the cost of a new television. <clears throat> Joaquin recently graduated from college and moved into his first apartment. He visits an electronics store to find a plasma TV, which is now almost obsolete here, flat screen TV, and is approached by a salesperson who tells him about the current store offer with no interest for one year. Joaquin decides he should purchase the television and take advantage of this free money while it's available. He puts the entire purchase of 1164 94 cents, including tax, on his credit card and takes the TV home with him. What should Joaquin's monthly payments be if he intends to pay off the television in full for the first year? So go ahead and pull out your phones. Put them on airplane mode for me. And when you get these no interest deals, this is our exercise we worked on Friday, the no interest, nothing down. So it's kind of a similar deal here. What should Joaquin's monthly payments be if he intends to pay off the television? with this deal. Uh, let's see. One, two, three. Michael, what'd you get? I just got on my phone. How are you going to solve it? What? So let's just do it together before you even pull out your phone. Don't even have to punch in the numbers. So zero interest, 1164, how are you going to solve the problem? What numbers are you planning to punch into your calculator? Well, first I was going to read the question. I have another question. Uh, you got 1164, because what he's buying was zero interest. So he's got the zero interest deal, no interest for one year. What's his monthly payments going to be if that's the deal? <laughs> One, two, three. Anna, what's your answer? Oh, I got 97. 97. How'd you get it? Okay, divided by 12. So you took the 1164.94 divided by 12, right? 12 months. So what'd you get exactly? 97 what? 0.07. Okay, so that's the monthly payment that Joaquin should be doing. Zero percent. So now where can zero percent for one thing not be exactly 0% that we've learned already. These, these financing deals look good, but hey, there's no interest, and it's divided by 12, but it's, it's not costing me any interest. What can, uh, what's true about taking these no interest deals that we did on like Friday and it's in the videos? 
what kind of pitfalls might we have? Okay, change of job. So now you set yourself up that you have to make these payments, you lose your job, All right? So that would be one thing. Is 1164 the best price that he could have gotten? Probably not. Pull in some hundred dollar bills, maybe you can pick that TV up for a thousand bucks or something, right? So with these zero percent deals, they tend to build the interest into the purchase price. And then we just suck right up to it. So it's like the interest is factored into the price. Does that make sense? Like the, tea, like the store would have been selling this baby for $1,000, but instead they added $164 worth of interest into the price, right? They just mark it up to then finance the price. Okay, so that's another thing. Um, so we've got the possibility of late fees and all that. So let's take a look here. So number two, Joaquin misses a payment, maybe because the job lost by just two days, and now has to pay the interest charges for the entire year. The annual percentage rate is 22.9. How much does he owe for the accrued interest? So he's gonna have to pay interest similar to what we did on Friday on the full amount. Go ahead and calculate the interest. Calculate the interest. For one year, 22.9 percent on the full balance well uh, let's see one two three daily what did you get okay what's your process let's talk through the process so we're going to calculate the interest What's the balance that we owe, first of all? What do we owe these people that we got the TV from? 1164. So we owe 1164.94. And how much interest do we owe in a percentage rate form? Yeah. 22.9. So then I need to multiply this balance times what? As far as what you punch into the calculator. 0.229, good. All right, go ahead and punch it in now. Did somebody else punch it in? What did you get? 266.67? Seven. Seven, seven. Is that what you got, David? Yeah. All right, I haven't punched it in yet. So 266, 266 bucks, that is for missing the payment. On top of if we just paid cash, Maybe we could have talked them down a hundred bucks, right? So now we have this potential three to four hundred dollar swing that is out there for not paying cash. So bottom line, what they're trying to get through in this chapter especially is don't be sucked into the zero percent, 90 days, same as cash, one year, zero percent financing. It's all over the place in the media, right? It's everywhere. Everything, even even your dog. I, did I tell you guys my dog story yet? Did I tell you my dog story? This brochure literally came from the veterinarian uh, up in Olathe. So my dog, uh, Sterling, big fluff ball, um, was having kind of the clouded eye thing, right? So it looked like he was kind of going blind or whatever. We went, went to our local vet and they said, well, this is going to be a specialist job. So we go to Olathe. Uh, she looks at him for, you know, 10 minutes and says, well, we have a special surgery that will clear up Sterling's eye problem, lickety split, um, and it's $1,600. And I'm like, $1,600? Uh, what's wrong with the one I've done? Well, my wife didn't like that answer. So apparently one eye isn't enough, at least if you're a dog in our family. And so I'm like, 16, I, and I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. I, we were tight, we we're not gonna be throwing that type of money around. So, so I, uh, I asked the guy, or she said, oh, uh, I said 1,600 and you know, about the price. And she said, oh, well here, we got this, handed me care credit, right? So it's literally to finance, it's just an application. They specialize on giving loans for your pet, care credit. And I'm like, we don't do loans. We, uh, you know, we're kind of Dave Ramsey people. 
And I said, uh, I've got 1100 cash. What do you think the vet said? They, she took it. 1100 cash. Most Americans would not have done what I did, right? That's an anti-American, especially if you dog. Well, I would have walked out of there maybe not even get the surgery done, but that's just me. You know? cruel and unusual economist, but so we got the thing done, 500 bucks compared to taking what I say is the easy way out. When you have credit presented to you, is this an emotional deal? Now I'm kind of dramatizing a little bit here, but is this an emotional deal when your dog is certain or whatever? Of course it is, right? And so, but having your ducks in a row saying, we don't do credit. I was able to say that legitimately to the person, we don't do loans. You know, how can we find another solution? Kind of forcing yourself to look for another solution, save me 500 bucks. And we got the dog fixed, and then the dog ran out into the street chasing a squirrel and got hit by a truck. That was like a year or two later, so we got a couple of good years with him having a good eye. But, um, he was a sweet old, sweet dog, very sweet. Not, not, not the sharpest neck in the drawer, but um, very sweet. Okay, so that is Joaquin. So let's look at Ella here. Uh, while Ella was driving to campus, she noticed a billboard with a girl wearing the same designer jacket she'd seen in a celebrity magazine. She was reading over lunch when she picked up her mail that day she had a flyer for 30% off at a store that displayed that same jacket. So explain how marketing influenced her. Um, just want to have an open discussion on this one. So what's true about the marketing that went on? Was she just super lucky? Was this her lucky day? So she's driving to campus. There's a billboard with a girl wearing the designer jacket she'd seen in the magazine. And then she picks up her mail and it's 30% off. It's like lucky day, right? Jackpot. What's going on here with Ella? What was that quote we had? Um, Luck favors the prepared when we did our interview process, right? I talked about stalking your interview person on Facebook. What do you think's going on here? Was Ella lucky or what's what do you think's at play here? She ordered the magazine and she wanted that magazine made the marketing on the front there. Okay. So would they know maybe her specifically? No, but that type of magazine, do they know the readership is 80% college female? Perhaps, right? So we got the readership of the magazine to 80% college female. Uh, what about that billboard she drove by? Where was it placed? Driving towards campus. Driving towards campus. So close to a college campus. And then finally, the 30% off. Was that mailed to all of Ottawa? Can they send mailing to certain zip codes or certain places and target mailing? Could it have been sent just to the college students only? Yeah. Right. So all of a sudden, Ella is looking very targeted, more targeted than lucky. Right. So this is this is pretty normal marketing 101 on how you can get multiple things going to imprint things. And so when you feel lucky and you want to go out and get the jacket, um, maybe you weren't as lucky as you were. Now it's still a good deal, right? If Ella bought the jacket at 30% off, is that a good deal? 30% off. What could Kohl's or some other department store do with their pricing? What might they do with a 30% off type of deal? They could just mark it up and then take the 30% off. Mark it up, take it down. Kind of similar to what we did there, right? So if you have a $100 jacket, you know, just kind of using rough numbers, if, if you have a $100 jacket and we take it times the 30%, if we multiply it times 1.3, we have a $130 jacket and then it's 30% off, right? And then you get the deal down. So they can play with the numbers, marketing it up to market down, 
so that you feel like you're getting a, a good deal. Um, how many of you shop at Kohl's? Show of hands, how many people have stepped foot in a Kohl's? Taylor says no. All right, lots of people stepped in Kohl's. Well, Kohl's is the master of coupons. Um, it still blows me away sometimes. Some of those cashiers, they just have a PhD in couponing or something. It's like, oh, 30% off, 20%. Oh, we can use this sticker. Oh, this was marked off at the register. This one, you know, and then it's like, oh, 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 this big blur. And all of a sudden, you just saved $170 on, you know, purchasing uh, uh, $220 worth of stuff or something. So um, they make you feel good. And that's very intentional, right? Because everybody likes to feel like they got a deal. And so Kohl's has really mastered that. And of course, other places do it too. But I don't know if I've seen much better than the way Kohl's plays it out. All right, so that is that. Is that. Uh, ba -ba -bum. Yeah, I think we're good. We're going to get into the next video section here. Chapter 7, I'm going to give you guys my negotiating tips. This is kind of a fun chapter, looking for bargains, deal hunting. Okay, so how many of you uh, consider yourself a pretty good negotiator? Show of hands. Pretty good negotiator, Caleb. Just Caleb? You got some work to do. All right, there's lots of awesome tips in here, and, and you can really kind of go at your own pace. Um, I guess I consider myself a pretty awesome negotiator. Uh, I had my real estate license, um, so I represented lots of people in negotiations for house purchases. And, commercial buildings and, and other things. And I found other realtors aren't, weren't that good at it. So uh, there's definitely some skill and, and stuff that you can see in this chapter and stuff that you can work on as, as you go. So one of the things is just to, uh, so wait, wait, before I do that, why aren't you, why aren't people in general good negotiators or into negotiating? What do you think would be some reasons? Uh, Kim? Okay, avoiding the conflict is probably number one. How many of you, have, that's that's it pretty much. That pretty much nailed it. Don't want to do conflict, um, you know, just kind of avoid. Uh, again, I think to some degree for Americans in general, it's a function of our income and our wealth that we have enough money to pay to avoid that. Like if it's uncomfortable for us, then we just pay a higher price. It's not that big a deal. I got money, I got enough money to buy it. I can afford it, whatever. I'd love you to even if I budgeted. And so uh, I think it's good to kind of push that though, uh, because there's lots of opportunities out there and everybody is in a different boat in terms of the seller. It's not that you're taking advantage of them. If it's just a voluntary exchange, they can always say no, right? So you really have nothing to lose by asking for a price. And you want to do it though in a fair uh, and honest way was part of the message of that first section. And so um, you can come up with some different ways to do it. So I had a big old football player, Pierce, uh, in this class about seven years ago. He's long, long gone now, I him here six years ago. And he watched this video. He came back to class on Monday. He said, Russ, it worked. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, I, had a, I got a flat tire over the weekend. And I went to the tire repair place and um, he told me it was going to be $55, and I just said, I'm just poor college student. Is there anything more you can do? He dropped it to 40 just for asking. Just for asking. He's not lying. He is a poor college student, right? All he did was he just lofted it out there, and he's like, it worked. Now, is $15 on a $55 purchase, is that a decent amount of money? Yeah. I mean, $5 is 10%. $10 is 20%, $15 is 30% off. So if all of a sudden you start doing that, I already shared with you my negotiations with my veterinarian, that again was about 30%, right? Just for asking. So it, it's easier than you think, and it can be very non-confrontational. I think that's where some, depending on your personality, um, some people might need to you know, practice that a little bit more, but if you're a pretty easygoing, friendly person, it's really not that hard to ask for a better deal. And you do have to be prepared. They might say no, and, or, or 
they might say, or even with the car, if you said, well, you know, I, I could probably do 50. Is five bucks worth asking for just to loft it out for free in a fun, casual way that you're not being confrontational? Of course. To me, there's any way. So we can find ways to soften the confrontation, I think, is the thing that I want you to be, have kind of an open mind about as, as we go into uh, more into these videos and, and into negotiation. I think you guys, you can do it, but it, it would take a little bit of, a little bit of practice. Um, all right, so let's see. I wanted to uh, give you one, I'm gonna give you a multiple tips here. Um, they talked about honesty and integrity with this. And so I want you to write on your papers uh, Russ negotiating tip number one, anyway. I'll throw a couple of them. The one you turned in. Yeah, the one you turned in. Uh, and you can write it on a different paper if you want. It's pretty easy. It is just don't lie in plot. Don't lie in plot. Don't lie in plot. So one thing that you can do is uh, the integrity thing is huge. And so when you first start negotiating, um, you might find yourself doing like little white lies, like little small, like, oops, I don't have the money. Yes, you do. Like, I, I don't have the money to uh, buy this thing, right? So you're, you're trying to negotiate something and you're like, you know, I don't have the money. Even though, let's see, example here. So I got, $125 here. I'm at a garage sale. And somebody's got something for sale that I want to buy for 30 bucks. Okay, so 30 bucks. And I might be tempted to say, ah, oh, can you come down off the price? I don't really have that kind of money. I don't have that money. That's a lot, right? I mean, that person will never know, but you'll know. And you can practice not doing that. So don't lie imply you're going to feel a lot better at negotiating. So what do I mean by that? So maybe you do something like this. You saw I pulled this wallet out of here, right? And I'll put this in the back. Got the $30 on the stuff. And uh, this looks good. This looks, this looks really good. Will this work? <laughs> See the difference? I've got the money, but by doing this, I implied this is all I got. Right? Without lying, I said, will this work? He says, yeah. So you can get kind of creative at now. Is that dishonest for me to do it that way? Eh, you know? There, there's a ways to do it without lying is the main thing. So you can you can pick the ways that work for you. But over the years, this has worked for me really well. Here's another one that I've done on text messages, especially with uh, Craigslist buying and, and uh, for sale by owner, but with texting potential sellers. Um, I'll say something like, would $20 work? I'm on a budget. I say, would twenty dollars work? I'm on a budget. Now, I do the Dave Ramsey stuff. Am I lying? Am I on a budget? I'm on a budget. I've got a pretty healthy budget though. I got a pretty decently high income and, and not any debts and stuff, so that works for me. But I'm still on a budget. But normally, when people say I'm on a budget, what does it mean? You know, money's really tight. Money's really tight, right? So I'll text them, with twenty dollars work, I'm on a budget. They usually take it, and you know maybe there'll be a little bit of interaction back and forth, but it's pretty easy. And I don't have to lie. Figure out once you commit yourself. It's kind of like committing yourself to not taking on debt. Once you do that, once you kind of blocked that out of don't lie, then all of a sudden you can. Oh, you know what? You, people can kind of be impressed by the way you present it or what you say. And they'll think one way, uh, even though you know you're just trying to negotiate a better price. They can always turn it down, right? So um, I, I don't like to think of it 
taking advantage of somebody. They want to sell that thing too. In fact, when I offer $20, do I ever learn for sure that they wouldn't have taken 15? No. So they still won too, right? So there's win-win with that situation, even with negotiations. All right, questions or comments there? I'll get some of your guys' tips here. Let's move into the second one. Okay, so um, Nash is emotional, visual, and has a media speed. When have you seen one of these features at work? The cat. So open discussion on this one. You don't have to write it down. Cash. Anybody got some cash stories? So cash has the immediacy and the emotional part. Does anybody use cash on a deal where they felt that? Lots of share. walkway power when I bought my car I was like yeah if you don't go down two grand I'm not buying it and I was like okay I'm gonna leave and they're like okay wait 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 we'll give it to you and I was like yeah 
Did you, and did you actually start walking away or? Uh, well, yeah, no, I left the dealership and then they yeah. like called my dad the next, like that night and were like, hey, we talked to the manager and we said that we can do. Okay, good, good. Uh, you brought up the example that is very common. Are car dealers good negotiators? Are car dealers good negotiators? Yeah, they deal with it all the time, right? That's what their job is is to try to uh, you know sell cars and so they are professionals at it so when taylor says i you got to come down 2000 or we're not buying it are they going to immediately drop to 2000 or have they heard this a hundred thousand times during their career of selling cars they've heard it and so what do you need to do to get the 2000 like Taylor did? And I've, I've done that before. How many of you have actually walked away and had a seller call you back like Taylor's experience? They do, right? You do need to walk away. Like you literally need to leave the door and possibly get in your car. I got a call like that, um, oh, two days, three days later on a car that uh, I was trying to get. Um, so that is very common having that walk away power. So one more person want to share? Yeah, have a question? Well, I don't think of a good I don't know that. Okay, so you can put in, uh, you know, how you think it could work with a, a car is usually a good one, but um, I've done it at garage. I think mean, <laughs> you can uh, start walking away from something. I think I was buying the lawn mower with this. And, Walk away power is very powerful. And is that a hard negotiating tactic? I mean, no, it's easy, right? And can you always come back? This is what I like to make sure you know. Like, if I'm like, no, uh, uh, you know, $20 is the best I can do, and the seller says, no, can't do it. Okay. Yeah. And you can be friendly about it, right? You're not like pissed off or something. You don't have to be angry. You just, I understand. You know, money, money's tight. Can you always come back now and say, I just decided I will do 20? If the seller doesn't stop you as you're literally, so this is where it's a little bit of a skill, like you really, 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 really want it. And they're like, no, we're going to pay for it, right? And the whole thing with walking through a wheat field and kind of your body language on how you're doing. But if you convince them as best as you can, acting wise, uh, that you know, you're going to use some walk away power and you might be gone. You can always come back and say, you know what, as I was walking away, I really think I want it. I, I will give you this. You can always come back and do it. It's fun, right? So you, you got these tactics that you can do that aren't, you know, overly confrontational. So I kind of want to get that myth out of your head that it's going to be a fight, it's going to be a battle, we're going to negotiate it out. You can just have fun with it and try, you know, ask for a better deal. Do some walkaway power, and there's some other tips that we'll talk about on Thursday. So, 